Welcome back to the RSET training, Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide and Methane Budgets to Support the Global Stock Take. Today is the last part of the three-part webinar series, and in today's training, we'll be learning about top-down and bottom-up inventories to support the global stock take. The presenters in today's webinar are Dr. David Crisp and Dr. Brendan Byrne from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Dr. Daniel Cussworth from the University of Arizona. As a reminder, all the course materials, including recordings from each webinar, PowerPoint presentations, homework assignment, and question and answer documents can be found on the RSET training page provided at the link below. There will be one homework assignment for all three parts of the training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. A certificate of completion will be awarded to participants who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the due date of June 8th. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. I will now pass the presentation over to Dr. David Crisp to present on how atmospheric carbon dioxide and methane budgets can be combined with inventories to support a more complete, accurate, and transparent global stock take. David, over to you. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to part three of our webinar series on atmospheric carbon dioxide and methane budgets to support the global stock take. For those of you who participated in the first two parts of this webinar series, you'll recall that in part one, we introduced the need for rapid, deep, and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions to limit global warming to two degrees above industrial levels. We introduced the Paris Agreement and its global stock take for tracking progress of these goals. We then introduced the methods used to construct bottom-up inventories and top-down budgets of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases. Then in part two, we introduced the we, we described the methods used to create the top-down atmospheric budgets of carbon dioxide and methane on policy-relevant national to subnational scales. Here, we would like to continue that discussion and show how the top-down atmospheric CO2 and methane budgets can be combined with inventories to support a more complete, accurate, and transparent global stock take. In the first part of this series, we introduce human activities that are contributing to the buildup of carbon dioxide and methane in the Earth's atmosphere. We noted that human activities primarily of anthropogenic fossil fuel emissions were actually now the primary source of carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. The second largest source is land use and land use change in forestry. We also noted that these processes were part of a global carbon cycle where trees and other plants on land and also biology in the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and then re-releases carbon dioxide uh, to the atmosphere through respiration. The ocean absorbs carbon dioxide uh, as a gas and then re-releases it just as it, it dissolves and then exsolves from the ocean surface. In addition to these changes to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, another critical greenhouse gas, methane, is being added to the atmosphere by human activities. Human activities are responsible for about 60% of the emissions of methane to the atmosphere uh, uh, each year. And, and the total, the, the, the rest is being emitted primarily by natural wetlands uh, and wildfires and other natural processes. Natural processes now are removing over half of the carbon dioxide uh, that's being added uh, to the atmosphere by human activities. This is critical for reducing the rate of climate change. However, it's important to note that because natural processes in the land biosphere and in the oceans are controlling the amount of carbon dioxide that's added to the atmosphere, 
there is some concern that these natural processes might evolve uh, in response to human activities and climate change. So how do we track how much carbon dioxide we are adding to the atmosphere? It turns out we, we can do this in two different ways that were introduced in the first uh, part of this webinar series. We can use bottom-up inventories or top-down atmospheric budgets. In a bottom-up inventory, we actually track the amount of carbon dioxide or methane emitted to the atmosphere by introducing an activity index and an emission factor and multiplying these two factors together. For something like a stationary power plant, a typical activity index might include the number of petajoules of electricity generated in a given year. The emission factor might describe the number of tons of carbon dioxide emitted to the atmosphere for each petajoule. If we also have some forested area uh, on, in, in our domain and we want to track its emissions or uptake of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the activity there might include the number of hectares of, of forest that has been uh, or number of hectares of field that have been transport, transported to forest or vice versa. And the emission factor might be the number of tons of carbon dioxide per hectare uh, for that process. So that's, and then if we have many other factors in our domain that are emitting or absorbing carbon dioxide or methane, but we just add those up and we add them all up uh, starting up in a, in a bottom up processes process to determine the amount, total amount of, of carbon dioxide or methane emitted in our domain. Now, another way we can actually track emissions uh, and uptake of, of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases is to use top-down atmospheric budgets. Here, for example, we might have a satellite that is making measurements uh, of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. The satellite might measure uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in a parcel of air uh, prior to when it passes over your domain and find a particular value here about 410 parts per million. As the air passes over a power plant, we make another measurement and we might find that the amount of carbon dioxide uh, in that air parcel is now increased, increased to about 415 parts per million. As the wind moves that air parcel over a forested area, we might notice that the uh, air parcel now has only about 412 parts per million of carbon dioxide in it. So we can use an atmospheric inverse model to actually derive the fluxes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, from the power plant in this particular case and from the, uh, the forest here, uh, which might be absorbing carbon dioxide. So we can use either the bottom-up method or the top-down method, or actually combine these two approaches to quantify the amount of carbon dioxide that is emitted into the atmosphere or removed from the atmosphere by various processes within our domain. Now, both top-down and bottom-up methods have key assets and liabilities. Bottom-up inventories of greenhouse gas emissions and removals are really best for tracking emissions and removals from known sources with well-characterized activity data and emission factors. The best thing about these is that they can, these, 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 this particular approach is it provides direct insight into the effective, effectiveness of emissions reduction policies uh, for specific categories of specific sectors included in the inventory. The other useful thing about the bottom-up inventories is that they can provide a prior or a first guess, um, which is actually a useful, uh, a useful quantity needed for the top-down atmospheric inversions. Meanwhile, top-down atmospheric estimates of greenhouse, net greenhouse gas emissions removals uh, actually exploit the best available science for assessing the collective progress toward greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. They also offer a partially independent approach for assessing the completeness of the standard inventory methods based on activity data and emission factors. They can also track emissions changes on unmanaged lands and oceans associated with human activities or climate change. These particular activities are not tracked in the existing inventories. 
Finally, they can improve the traceability of emission policies to greenhouse gas abundances in the atmosphere and their impact on climate. So these two methods actually provide complementary approaches for monitoring greenhouse gas emissions and removals. To summarize that, we can think of bottom-up inventories as providing source-specific estimates of emissions and removals by known processes with well-characterized activity and emission factors, and top-down budgets as providing an integrated constraint on emissions removals. They can also track changes in the natural carbon cycle caused by human activities and climate change. So how can we compare and combine top-down budgets and bottom-up inventories of greenhouse gases? In principle, the bottom-up inventories and top-down flux budgets can be combined to produce a more complete and transparent inventory of emissions and removals of greenhouse gases. They can also be compared to assess the, co the collective progress toward the goals of the United Nations Framework Convention and Paris Agreement and to track the effects of human activities and climate change on the efficiency of the land, ocean, and atmospheric sinks of greenhouse gases. In practice, this is a little bit complicated because the bottom-up inventories and top-down flux budgets don't actually measure the same quantities over the same areas and over the same time period periods. They also have different sources of uncertainties. Here we review some of the assets and challenges and identify gaps needing attention in efforts to combine the bottom-up and top-down methods. To compare these methods, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC Task Force on Inventories, provided some guidance in their 2019 refinement to the 2006 IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories. In this document, they recognized that atmospheric measurements in inverse models had made notable advances since the 2006 guidelines were published and could be used for quality assessment and quality control of inventories. However, they concluded that these methods, while, while improving rapidly, were not yet widely established as a standard for verification of conventional inventories because of limitations in the measurement capabilities, uncertainties introduced by the atmospheric transport, and other uncertainties in the models. They also noted that these methods don't clearly separate anthropogenic emissions and natural sources and sinks, and, and identified this as a challenge. Because of these caveats, the parties to the Paris Agreement have not yet fully acknowledged this particular refinement to the IPCC guidelines. But in spite of that, some have actually already started implementing its recommendations. For example, we have some early adopters. The United Kingdom, Switzerland, and New Zealand were among the very first countries to adopt atmospheric inverse modeling results as a verification system for national inventory reports. The early use of these methods have been focused primarily on fluorinated gases and methane rather than CO2. These two targets, target gases were chosen because fluorinated species have no natural source interference and are, have very, very large uncertainties in conventional inventories and were a clear target uh, for this particular approach. Methane has both natural and anthropogenic sources, but it has a strong atmospheric signal to noise ratio. It's pretty easy to detect. Uh, and the inventories there also have large uncertainties. So for example, in New Zealand, they started tracking atmospheric methane uh, and used the atmospheric measurements both to track the total amount of, of methane added to the atmosphere uh, by New Zealand and also started looking region by region uh, at the uncertainty reductions and found that at least in some seasons, the atmospheric measurements could reduce the uncertainties in their bottom-up inventories by up to 30%. So this was a tremendous success story. And now many other nations are beginning to do this. So CO2 was not the primary target of the, by the early adopters, in spite of the fact that it's the primary uh, source of, of greenhouse gas warming 
And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first reason is that um, the primary source of greenhouse gas emissions is actually fossil fuel use, which is actually a, a well-tracked activity. Uh, countries measure the number of barrels of oil and the number of tons of coal that they use quite accurately. They also have very well characterized emission factors uh, on fossil fuels. So even though there's a tremendous amount of, of fossil fuel emissions uh, added to the atmosphere every year, the uncertainties on those emissions are quite small in the bottom up inventories. So the need for a, a top down inventory uh, is less uh, immediate. The second thing is that there's so much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere now that the changes produced as a, as a country or an individual, a large urban area or a factory uh, emits carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the, the changes in the atmospheric concentrations are tiny and you need really precise measurements, very, very high accuracy, even to detect these changes. And, and at, the, at the time, uh, over the last few years, those, those have been real challenges. However, um, agriculture, forestry, and other land use, which is the second largest human contributor to CO2 emissions uh, is facing different challenges than fossil fuels. In particular, there are much, much larger uncertainties on this particular sector of emissions, in part because the, both the activity indices are difficult to measure uh, and the emission factors are, are also quite uncertain. So we might have an opportunity there. There are also significant improvements in the top-down inventories of carbon dioxide. We've made dramatic improvements in the measurement accuracy in recent years, also the spatial resolution of the observations and the coverage. So these methods now are, are uh, actually uh, being refined as well to find ways to attribute anthropogenic and natural fluxes uh, more directly. There's also a, a potential role uh, in the development and validation of bottom-up inventories for agriculture, forestry, and other land use, which is also called land use and land use change in forestry in some of the inventory reports. So this, this area, Atalu, or, or Lulu CF, as we call it, uh, is a leading source of emissions in many developing countries. The uncertainties in activity data and emission factors often compromise the bottom-up AFLU inventories. For example, in the inventories that were presented in uh, the, the top-down atmospheric budgets introduced in part two of this webinar series, uh, we, we showed uh, the emissions from a variety of countries and in, in developing countries such as Brazil, Indonesia, and Nigeria, the top-down budgets actually have uncertainties that are comparable to uh, the bottom-up inventory uncertainties or actually substantially lower than the bottom-up uh, uncertainties uh, in some cases. So they, the, the additional advances in top-down methods are anticipated uh, actually for future stock takes as well. So they, they're, they're certainly going to be able to play a much bigger role in the future. So let's look at top-down methods and see what they're telling us about carbon dioxide emissions. How well can we actually track small changes in the carbon dioxide emission rates uh, associated with uh, emissions reduction activities? Well, we had a wonderful experiment uh, or maybe a tragic experiment over the last few years uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. So as many of you heard, uh, as, the, as in early in the COVID-19 pandemic, there were a series of of drastic lockdowns across the world. And those lockdowns led to reductions in the emissions of carbon dioxide uh, and, and, uh, and other uh, air pollutants in the atmosphere uh, as, as countries responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. As those lockdowns occur, we actually started watching the carbon dioxide uh, concentrations in the atmosphere very closely. And we were actually able to detect changes in the carbon dioxide uh, concentration of the atmosphere that were correlated in time with the actual lockdowns uh, in different regions of the world, including Asia, Western Europe, and, and also North America. In addition to that, we also knew that the largest changes in emissions uh, during 
the COVID-19 pandemic were occurring over large urban areas. And our colleagues on the Japanese GOSAT team uh, were able to actually track the emissions reductions over particular large cities. Here uh, we're showing Tokyo and we're see seeing that in the goal bars here for 2020, uh, we saw the lowest emissions uh, in, in recent years uh, over Tokyo uh, during the lockdowns. So these observations clearly show that atmospheric observations could play a role in detecting small changes uh, in CO2 and um, CO2 emissions over the Earth. And so this is actually uh, quite promising. So let's say that we go out and we make estimates of bottom-up emissions, and then we also compare those to the top-down top -down budgets. And let's say that we get different answers. First of all, why are we getting different answers? And secondly, uh, how do we reconcile those differences to produce better inventories? This is an area that was actually addressed by the 2019 IPCC refinement on the 20, 2006 uh, task force on inventories. They identified three critical areas for top-down methods. They identified the need for rapidly improving atmospheric observations. They also identified the need for well-validated atmospheric image modeling tools. And finally, they introduced, they, or they identified the need for collaboration between inventory compilers, atmosp the atmospheric measurement and modeling community, and policymakers and stakeholders, such as the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is exactly what we've been doing and presenting in this webinar series. In part one, we showed that atmospheric observations, both from the ground and from space, are improving quite rapidly in terms of their coverage and their resolution. In addition, the accuracy of the measurements has been improving rapidly uh, due to significant progress uh, in measurement technology. In addition to that, our colleagues in the inverse modeling community have been working together, showing, uh, developing new methods and then integrating those methods together to produce more complete and more accurate and higher resolution descriptions of the emissions and removals of carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases uh, from the system. Collaboration is an area that's still a little bit of a work in progress and is one of the primary objectives uh, of this webinar series. The IPCC guidelines also touched on the needs for improving the utility of inverse model methods uh, for comparison to national inventories. They pointed out that the utility of these methods depends critically on the accuracy and precision. They also suggested that inverse modeling systems have to be tested and validated against multiple methods, and that the number, quality, and frequency of measurements has to be adequate to actually constrain the, the emissions that we're trying to measure. They also pointed out that the greenhouse gas and certain that these, these methods will have the greatest utility in places where the greenhouse gas uncertainty in the inventories is large. And they came up with things like flowcharts that help users to know how to actually test the relative value of top-down budgets in their use with, with bottom-up inventories. So what do we do when we have a top-down atmospheric budget and a bottom-up inventory and they don't agree? The IPCC Task Force on Inventory also came up with a series of recommendations for reconciling these differences. And this is a seven-step plan. It starts with actually confirming that the top-down budgets and inventories represent the same time periods in the same areas. They recommended that we check to see what emissions data set was used in the in, as the inverse model prior. We always start with an initial guess for the emissions, uh, as you learned in part two of this webinar series, and determine whether or not that this, this prior actually agrees with or does not agree with the bottom of inventory. They suggested when we assess how the inverse model treats anthropogenic and natural emissions, because once again, top-down methods may do that differently than bottom-up methods. 
then confirmed that the seasonal variability of emission and other factors such as extreme events have been taken into account in the two different methods the same way, or if not, to change to determine how those those processes may those transient processes may have affected the inventories. Then assess how uncertainties and assess the amplitude of the uncertainties and determine whether the discrepancy is actually statistically significant. So if we have a top-down and a bottom-up estimate of emissions, but they both have very large uncertainties on them, uh, the uncertainties may overlap if the actual values, act, the, the average values actually disagree. Finally, if you have uh, a sub-national regions with very large discrepancies, uh, determine which emission activities are actually occurring in those areas. And finally, as you start to uh, modify your national inventory plans, uh, you might want to prioritize emission sources and regions with the largest discrepancies between top-down budgets and bottom-up inventories. So this is just a set of recommendations that was developed uh, a few years ago. Prior to the actual uh, development and existence of, of high quality global top down budgets. But let's see where we are today and what some of the challenges are in act implementing these recommendations. Well, first of all, are we measuring the same area? This is a significant question because countries actually have borders and national inventories are defined within those national borders. So, uh, and so we have not only borders between nations, we also have borders between land and sea. We have borders between biomes, let's say forest or crop, large areas where crops are grown. And these play critical roles in developing bottom-up inventories, but they're actually quite hard to resolve in top-down budgets. So once again, the top-down budgets are typically derived on a regular grid that covers the globe, and then we have to map those results to country boundaries, and there are uncertainties introduced in that process. The other thing that is, uh, the other type of border that is a main problem, uh, is a primary problem, is the definition of, of managed land versus natural land. The emissions inventories only include emissions and removals from managed lands. The bottom up or the top down uh, atmospheric budgets actually cover both managed and unmanaged lands. So in, in the national inventories, the emissions from unmanaged lands are actually expected not to change much. But and, and the other point to make is that some nations actually have very, very large regions that are defined as unmanaged. For example, here we see uh, a map of the Northern Hemisphere with uh, Russia shown in blue and green and, and then Canada as well over here. Uh, and what we see is the, the blue areas are the areas that are claimed as managed land and the green areas are regions that are considered to be unmanaged land. A lot of the largest changes that we're actually seeing uh, in the emissions and removals of carbon dioxide are occurring in these areas that are called unmanaged land now. One of the challenges in, that, that are posed by managed and unmanaged land is that different groups actually define different regions as managed and unmanaged land. And it's actually quite difficult to even determine what map was used by a country when they were defining their unmanaged versus managed land. It also turns out that different groups, such as the assessment, the integrated assessment modelers, such as the IPCC, uh, the carbon cycle community, or running the dynamic global vegetation models, and the national inventory, uh, national greenhouse gas inventory communities are all using different definitions of managed land and unmanaged land. This is just a matter of definitions and labeling, uh, but it's an area that needs additional uh, discussion uh, and additional collaboration among these different groups to come up with a common definition so that everybody is working from the same set of rules. So that should be a solvable problem. The other issue is that bottom-up inventories and top-down budgets uh, actually use different time periods sometimes, not, not on purpose, but sometimes just by accident. It turns out that bottom-up estimates are obtained in two different ways, using something called a stock difference approach or a gain-loss mechanism. 
And these methods are actually summarized here, but we're not going to go through that in detail. I'll just point out that the bottom-up methods, especially the stock difference approach, benefits tremendously from multi-year averaging periods. So looking for a change in a stock, and the longer you wait, the larger the change is and the easier it is to measure. So they typically report things based on long time periods. And if they, for example, that time period might be a decade. But if you, they may report that decade, they may report uh, emissions year by year, but they'll just assume that they're constant over a decade. Meanwhile, top-down methods are exactly the opposite. Most top-down methods are based on measurements that are actually snapshots of the atmospheric uh, CO2 or methane field uh, collected while these gases are being transported by the wind. Here, we need really rapid sampling to resolve the time dependence of the changes in CO2 or methane uh, as they're transported, as, as described in, in uh, part two of this webinar series. Generally, more th these methods are much more sensitive to transient events, such as floods and droughts and pandemics and things like that. The, the, other, the other issue is that, that these, these methods have actually only been available in a global context at high spatial resolution for relatively short time periods. So these are not actually looking at these long time periods like decades, typically. So as, you, as we heard in part two, uh, we start with a series of measurements, which are essentially snapshots. We put them into uh, a, a transport model, uh, and then we use a flux inversion system. Uh, to derive fluxes, and then we look at those flux changes over, over time. And sometimes we see uh, results that are, e even when we see results that in the average are pretty, pretty constant, as seen here over Australia, uh, the, the bottom-up in the, the bottom inventories are showing essentially a constant value near zero. The top-down uh, budgets are showing really quite a bit of year-to-year -year variability within that time period. Uh, and so once again, we have to make sure that we're, we're actually measuring the same period of time uh, when we're using these methods, and that's not straightforward. So let's take a quick look at some of the ongoing efforts to compare top-down budgets with bottom-up inventories. Most of the ongoing efforts uh, have been conducted by the science community. We touched on a couple earlier where national inventory communities have been using these, but most are science activities. In a, in a large global study by Ding et al., they introduced a framework con for converting uh, the derived quantity in, in these studies, the net ecosystem exchange, and, and actually then uh, using data from inside to and GOSAT data um, and ensembles of inverse models, they developed some products and then showed how they could be compared to national land use, land use change, and forestry in this in inventories with this framework. Adopting a very similar approach, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, or CIOS, has analyzed global net biospheric exchange estimates from an ensemble of inverse models constrained by inside to GOSAT and OCO2 data to produce the, the pilot top-down CO2 and methane budgets that we've talked about primarily in this webinar series. In addition to that, the World Meteorological Organization's Integrated Global Greenhouse Gas Information System, or IGAS, has held stakeholder consultations to compile best practices for tracking land use and land use change in forestry and urban emissions using atmospheric measurements. And then finally, individual research teams have used airborne and space-based observations of carbon dioxide and methane to quantify emissions from intense point sources such as power plants in large urban areas. So all of these ongoing efforts have been conducted primarily by the science community. The kinds of products that they've produced are illustrated here. Here are some of the results in the study by Ding et al. And what we find is, uh, as shown here, we see the top-down budgets shown in as uh, green dots with their uncertainty shown as light green uh, shaded areas. Uh, and then we see black dots, which are the national inventories. Uh, reported by a series of countries here, about 16 shown here. We see that in some, some countries we have national, such as the USA here, we can see that the national inventories uh, and the top-down budgets actually agree quite well uh, in, in the mean, uh, and, but that the top-down uh, budgets actually show uh, substantially more variability as we, uh, with time. In other areas, such as Canada here, we'll see, we see that for land use and land use change, 
uh, that the inventory assumes net zero uh, flux almost uh, throughout the period shown here from about 1990 through 2020, whereas the, the top-down budgets actually show that the Canadian biosphere is absorbing quite a bit of CO2. So there's a large bias between the top-down and bottom-up results. Similar experiments have been performed for uh, methane, and there, once again, we see that in, in, in many regions. Uh, I'll use the U.S. again here as an example where the, the uh, top-down and bottom-up results agree quite well over the period shown here, but that in other places, such as Brazil shown here, there's actually a bias between the top-down and bottom-up results. But it's interesting to note that the trend is the same in, in both. So once again, there's a lot to learn here by comparing the top-down and bottom-up results. So now that you've seen how top-down budgets are created and how they can be compared to bottom-up inventories, I'm going to uh, hand you over to my colleague, Brendan Byrne, who is going to give us an example of how to access and use a top-down national CO2 budget. Over to you, Brendan. Great. Thanks, Dave. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, this data set that uh, we've generated. Um, as I described last week, and how you can download it and start trying to look at the data. The first metric we give is called a Z statistic. And this basically is a description of the statistical difference between uh, two experiments, the in situ experiment and the LNLG experiment. So as we mentioned last time, we ideally want these uh, different experiments to give the same result but sometimes they can diverge quite a bit, um, which is due, uh, which is poorly understood, but due to a combination of a lack of in situ data over much of the globe, and also potential uh, residual biases in the LNLG assimilated data. And the results are, are most robust when the experiments agree with each other. And so this is giving a metric for how consistent these LNLG and in situ experiments are. So before describing the statistic, I'll first show the difference between the LNLG and in situ measurements on the left. So what you can see is that in general, we see the largest differences in the tropics, such as South America and Africa, and also in smaller countries in northern extratropics, parts of Europe and parts of Asia. Now, these raw differences uh, tell you how different the median fluxes are but they don't really tell you the differences within the context of the uncertainty on these fluxes. And that's what this Z statistic is meant to do. So it's the difference between the median net carbon exchange for the LNLG experiment to the median net carbon exchange from the in situ experiment divided by the standard deviation of these differences, which is basically a, a metric of uncertainty on these fluxes across the ensemble. And so this is a little bit of a complicated um, statistic, but basically what it's telling you is how different the fluxes are relative to the uncertainty on the fluxes. The larger the magnitude, the larger the difference is relative to the uncertainty. So you can see in some places like Canada um, pop up here because the difference between the LNLG and in situ experiments are large relative to their uncertainties, but the uncertainties are still very tight. So the absolute differences between the LNLG and in situ experiments for Canada are quite small. In many places in the tropics, um, you see that these differences aren't as large as this uh, first difference plot would make you believe because the uncertainty on these estimates in the tropics is often larger, particularly for the in situ experiment. Now, overall, um, if the values are less than about plus or minus two, then that means that the differences between the LNLG and in situ experiment are within one standard deviation of each other and largely uh, safe to use. As you go beyond plus or minus two, it's telling you that there is a bigger difference uh, between these experiments um, and we urge caution in, in this case. So the, the second metric we're providing is called the influence of assimilated data or IAD. And this is basically giving you a, a sense of how well the fluxes for a country uh, 
can be estimated by the data available. So, you know, as we know, fluxes are, are best captured, flux estimates best capture um, the true fluxes when you have lots of CO2 measurements occurring nearby. So lots of information from the measurements is going into your estimate. You know, and, and as we showed last time, for the in situ measurements, they are quite heavily located in North America and Europe and quite sparse in the tropics, while those CO2 land data is somewhat more uniform. Now, the way we calculate this influence of assimilated data is rather complicated and has to do with Bayesian statistics, but is calculated as one minus the uncertainty in our estimates from the inversions divided by our prior estimate of the uncertainty in the fluxes. And when the IAD is close to zero, that means the assimilated CO2 data is not constraining the fluxes very well. Um, when IAD is close to one, that means the CO2 fluxes are being very well estimated by the atmospheric CO2 data. Some maps of this IAD value for the in situ um, experiment and for the LNLG experiment are shown on the bottom here. And you can see this the magnitude of this value increases as you go to places with more measurements. So for example, for the in situ experiment, you can see that you get uh, dark colors close to one for North America, where you have lots of measurements, but you get uh, quite light colors close to zero for lots of places within Africa, where you have very few measurements. And then for the OCO2 experiments, you see that uh, many of these regions in the tropics where you don't, where you had quite a small value for the in-situ data have increased quite a bit because there's many more OCO2 measurements in these regions. All right, so now I'm going to um, give an example of how you can download our data and take a look at it and plot up some of the fluxes we provide, as well as interpreting these fluxes with these uh, metrics we provide. So as I mentioned last time, you can download our data from the Committee on Earth Observing Satellites webpage. Here I'll go to the general uh, global stock take webpage and show you, you know, how to get to our uh, data set from this front web page. So there are all these different data sets you can take a look at, uh, driven by satellite observations, and ours is under the CO2 and methane fluxes. So if I click on more information, this is showing details of these pilot top-down carbon dioxide and methane budgets with some background descriptions here. And then at the bottom, we can go to our carbon dioxide webpage. And then this has a description of this data set that I've been describing. Um, if your native language is, is Spanish or Spanish or French, you can uh, click on these top icons here and see the text in your native tongue. All right, so now we'll download the data set. and I will open the data. Okay, so, all right, so here is our pilot data set. Um, this is our data set for our set training. We are just finalizing uh, this data set and a new one will be posted within the next month or so and it will come with a DOI and we recommend using that version for any publications that you use uh, this data for. Um, and here's my contact information. You know, we, we really want uh, people to be using this data and, and trying to use it in new uh, ways. And so, you know, feel absolutely free to contact me if you have any questions or would like any help or more specific um, estimates from these data. Here's a, a brief description of the data, and then we have listed the different variable names. So each of these variables uh, will be, from top to bottom, will be in the uh, different uh, columns from A, B, C, D, and down. So the first column is the alpha three code, and this is a three letter country code, or ISO code that you can look up. As I'll show at the bottom, we also have some supranational regions 
um, like, such as the European Union and the African Union that we provide fluxes for, and I'll go through those at the end. The second uh, column is the year, and then we get into the different data sets we provide. Oh, note that there's a bit of a typo here. This is a 2015 to 2020 mean values, which will be corrected in the final data set. Um, we have our carbon stock loss estimates first for the in-situ experiment, then the uncertainty on this estimate, then we have the LNLG carbon stock loss and the uncertainty on this estimate, and then the LNLGIS carbon stock loss and the uncertainty on that estimate, and then the LNLGOGIS carbon stock loss estimate and the uncertainty on that estimate. We then have the same thing for the net biosphere exchange estimates that we produce, followed by uh, the net carbon exchange estimates that we produce. We also provide the um, ancillary data that we use um, from bottom-up methods. So we have our river uh, fluxes as well as our uncertainties and our combined crop and wood fluxes um, and their uncertainties and the fossil fuel emissions and their uncertainties. Finally, the last few rows show these uh, statistics that I mentioned, or these metrics that I mentioned before that can be used for help interpreting the data. So there's a said statistic and this influence of assimilated data for the in situ experiment, for the LNLG experiment, and the combined LNLG IS experiment. All right, now let's uh, take a look at some of these data and, and try plotting some of uh, these fluxes up. So as I mentioned before, at the top here, you see for Afghanistan, you have um, each of 2015 to 2020 fluxes, and then you have the mean flux across these six years. And then in these rows, you have these in quantities. So you have the carbon stock loss, net biosphere exchange, net carbon exchange, lateral fluxes and fossil fuel emissions, and then our different statistics. So now as we go through uh, looking at some of these countries, uh, it's useful to go through looking at these metrics we provide. So remember we want our Z statistic to be uh, as close to zero as possible, ideally less than two. And we want this influence of assimilated data or IAD values to be large, uh, closer to one than to zero. So for example, for Afghanistan here, we see quite consistent results in terms of the Z statistic but we see the in situ data is not really constraining the fluxes over Afghanistan very well. We get a very small value here. The LNLG experiment is uh, doing a little bit better, uh, but still not great. And the combined data experiment is basically doing the same as the LNLG experiment. Now going down a country, we can see this country below, uh, which is um, AGO. I'm not sure which country that is, uh, you know, has, has quite a bit larger IAD uh, values uh, than Afghanistan. So we think this, this country is being better constrained by the data. All right, we can browse through and let's look for a country that has, uh, you know, quite strongly constrained fluxes from our data and also quite consistent fluxes between the different data sets using this um, Z statistic. Okay, so some of these countries are looking pretty good, but I want to see something a little bit higher, maybe. So let's go down to 256, which I have pre-planned here, and this is China. All right, so for 256, we see that we're getting pretty small Z statistic values, and we're also getting, you know, reasonably good constraints from the in-situ data and even better constraints from LNLG and the combined data experiment. So let's try plotting up um, some fluxes for China. So um, I've already gone ahead and looked at where uh, these different fluxes are. And so I'm going to plot up uh, line 256 and row S, which is the net carbon exchange um, for China over the six years. So I'll take these, these values and then I'll insert a bar plot. Okay, so here we're going to plot up China net carbon exchange and fossil fuel emissions. Okay, so I can 
I can click on this chart area and select my data. So this first one, column I've selected is the in situ experiment, in situ net carbon exchange. I'll now add in a second set of data, um, which, whoops, sorry, I need to move my chart. Okay. So I'll now add in a second set of data here, which this is from the LNLG. Of course, I've, I've ahead of time gone and looked up which rows and columns these are. So this is the LNLG data. This first one is the in situ data. I'll now add a new column, which is the LNLG IS net carbon exchange. LNLG IS carbon exchange. And one more. Uh, so this is the LNLGOGIS, and then we'll add in one more, which is the fossil fuel. This is down A E. And then I will add a legend. Okay. So what we're looking at here is the net carbon exchange uh, for in situ LNLG, LNLGIS, and LNLGOGIS shown in these four bar plots, and the fossil fuel emissions for each of these years, where one is uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. 19 and 2020. So what we see for China here is, of course, China has quite large fossil fuel emissions. Um, and we see that the net carbon exchange is below the fossil fuel emissions. And this is primarily due to net uptake um, in terrestrial carbon stocks over China. So we have this negative uh, uh, carbon stock loss. So if we look across these years, what we can see is that there has been um, an increase in fossil fuel emissions, but perhaps more dramatically, we've seen an increase in net carbon exchange um, across the different experiments, which seems to suggest that um, the carbon uptake by the biosphere over China has decreased over these uh, six years. Now, this is not a, a, a long-term trend. This is more intraannual variability, but it's an interesting result from our analysis. All right, so that's one way to view our data. Now, I want to go down and show you these different regions that we've created. So as I mentioned before, we've generated country level uh, data, but we've also generated um, these aggregate regions. So let me just bring this up here. So we have the Asian region, we have the African Union. The African Union also has a number of sub-regions, which we've included here. Uh, this region is, is basically all of South America plus Central America, all the way up to Mexico. This is another region um, containing much of Central Asia. We also have Europe and the EU and uh, SARC, uh, the Middle East, and North America. Um, the exact countries included in these regions will be included in our, our paper. Um, and uh, some of these large, you know, uh, SARC and so on, well-known uh, international uh, uh, aggregations of countries can be, you know, seen on Wikipedia from which their member states are. Okay. So how about as an example here, we take this uh, Southern African Union region. So I will just show you uh, these. So this is just showing a plot of these regions over Africa. Each so this is the the North, uh, West, Central, East, and Southern regions. 
So let's take a look at this southern region here and try to see how uh, carbon stock loss has changed over the past um, six years from 2015-2020. All right, so as if you scrolled up, um, I've already looked this up before, this is the in situ uh, carbon stock loss panel. So I'll highlight these and then insert a bar chart. I will change it to uh, African Union South uh, Carbon Stock Loss. And then I will, so I've added the in situ. Uh, now I will also add the LNLG. Oh, and my chart is in the way again. So this is in situ, then I'll add in the LNLG data. Uh, and then let's add in the LNLGIS, just, oh, whoops, sorry, LNLGIS. LNLGIS. Okay, and let's just make this plot. Okay, and then we'll insert the legend. Okay, so what we're seeing here is the uh, carbon stock loss uh, over the these six years from 2015 to 2020. And what you can see is that uh, in 2015, 2020, we see uh, you know positive values, meaning release to the atmosphere. So you have loss of carbon stocks over 2015, 2016, coinciding with this large El Nino. Uh, in 2017, you have quite dramatic carbon uptake occurring over uh, this African Union South region. And then you again see some variability over the last few years. So we're seeing some consistent results across this region and some interesting year-to-year -year variability in carbon stock loss uh, changes. And so, you know, this might be an interesting uh, data set to include in some analysis of how carbon stocks are changing over Africa. Perhaps this 2017 event was linked to rainfall or something like that. So I hope this gives you a rough idea of how uh, to look at this data set and, and um, plot up some of these values. You know, I encourage everyone to take a look and try to use this in your experiments. And please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions about how to use these data. And with that, I think I will hand it back over to Dan to talk about uh, methane. OK, great. Thanks so much, Brendan. And now I want to shift our focus a little bit more onto the point sources and how we can use information from the point sources, both in CO2 and in methane, to inform inventories, but also to guide mitigation. It's really important to remember that with the localized point sources, you know exactly where the emission is coming from. So that can be used not just for quantification or for inventories, but for actual action. And you can pinpoint many times to the exact facility that needs to be monitored if there's for example some sort of malfunction or you think that there's some sort of issue happening at that facility so i want to start first with co2 and what we've been able to see from the satellite data and how that can be used to help validate against inventories so what i'm showing here on the left panel is an oco3 snapshot area mode map so a sam or a sam as they're uh, commonly referred to. And in the bottom right of this, you can see that there's a really strong plume signal coming from uh, this set of data. And where it's red, you see that cluster of red pixels. That's located exactly with the Belchatov power plant, which is located in Poland. And so 
you can take this imagery and these concentrations, fit a transport model to it, and infer. We talked at last, uh, you know, in our last call about these plume quantification approaches. So you can apply something like that. Here they've applied a Gaussian plume model to it to come up with an estimate of what the emissions are during this snapshot. And so that's what I have shown here on the right. But a reminder is that, so the, so the bottom up, uh, the top down inventory is what I have Q top, is when you do that quantification. But as a reminder, a bottom up inventory would also make an emission estimate of this facility by um, looking at the activity data and the emission factors. The activity in this case is the power generation of that facility, and then there's an emission factor that gets applied to it. And the bottom up suggests a very similar emission rate. So when you have this type of good reporting and bottom up emission estimates, it's a way to validate with the top down measurements that your reporting bottom up, you know, emission estimation algorithms are of the same family and of the same class. Now here's another example though, again with the OCO3 SAM, but this is a power plant in India where we do not have that same bottom-up information publicly available for people to check. But we do have the satellite information which will delineate this plume and we can estimate an emission rate for it. And so now if you have a top-down emission estimate, you can compare that to, well, I, if I know what the power generation is, maybe I can infer what an appropriate emission factor would be given that I know two of the three variables. And then you can compare that emission factor against maybe what are some commonly used emission factors in the literature to say, does this seem as if I have a discrepancy or not have a discrepancy? And so this is really important because in the absence of good publicly available bottom-up inventories or in situ in staff monitors, this top-down approach can not only monitor, quantify, but it can also be used to help refine estimates that might go up into a, bo into a bottom-up inventory. Um, this can also be done on the methane side and from multiple perspectives. One, again, if there's known emission sources and you have a plume emanating from a known emission source, you can certainly compare against bottom up and top down estimates at that facility to refine your emission factors. But there's another question as well with methane, which is how much unquantified methane in the bottom up inventories are we actually detecting from space? So this plot on the left I showed in part two, but it's a map of ultra emitting methane sources that were detected with the Tropomi satellite um, over the course of, of the satellite's lifetime that was just recently published, published. And so these ultra emitters really represent things that aren't well quantified in inventory because they either represent um, maintenance events that are probably lasting longer than, uh, than normal or what is anticipated. So it's having an outsized effect on the total methane budget or it represents malfunctions. So things that are very difficult to put in a robust way into a bottom-up inventory. But it can be a significant fraction. And, you know, up to maybe this, this study estimating about 10% of the global methane uh, fossil fuel budget, or at least oil and gas budget. And so having this as well, if there is a certain sector in a bottom-up inventory that you know is not well quantified, with the framework of activity data and emission factors, the top down can add that additional piece on top where you're saying, okay, what is this other segment that I don't have a great quantification on and how can I use the satellite information to have a more representative um, inventory of all of the processes that are occurring. Um, and again, I really wanna drive home the point with these localized plume images is that, you know, they can represent a big part of your emission inventory um, I have this slide and also the slides that we showed in part two where we were saying, you know, in some regions, 20, 20 to 60 percent of all of the methane that's emitted in that region is from a very disproportionate size of a few super emitters where you actually know the locations of. And so, you know, this is starting to help us now really contextualize. So, you know, both in terms of the inventory and eventually what I'll show in terms of mitigation, this helps us contextualize the issue. You start asking these questions of, OK, well, if I have uh, you know, a top-down estimate from a, from a flux a course resolution, you know, flux mapper or a bottom-up inventory, I can start saying, well, how much of those localized sources that I also quantify contribute to that total budget? 
And then you can compare that to your national inventory. And you know, there's cases where you might say, look, the localized sources alone might be larger than what my entire national inventory is predicting. Or you might say it's 50% of what my national inventory is predicting. Or you might say, well, my national inventory is, is only 50% of what a flux estimate of the total flux. But the important thing here is that there's several different ways to contextualize your um, emissions with both the bottom up and the top down. And I'll show an example of that with a uh, data portal once we get done with this section. Um, and again, going back to what I said, uh, and like with the CO2 example, this can be done on a facility by facility basis. So the plot I'm showing on the left are the results from airborne analyses that were done in California, where they had a point source estimate, a localized point source estimate at a certain facility, and they got it from a remote sensing approach, but then they also flew an airborne in situ sensor to get a mass balance approach, so one to validate the remote sensing, but then the green diamonds also represent what the bottom up inventory was predicting. So you can see, if you, especially if you look at the right panel of the plot, is that in most of the cases at the landfills and the refineries, the bottom up estimate of the methane emissions was a factor or two um, lower than, uh, than what the top down measurements were quantifying from two different independent top down measurements. So again, the idea is, well, what would the bottom up inventory tell me at that facility? What is the atmosphere telling me at that facility? And if there's a discrepancy, which there is in this case, how do we figure that out? Is it a problem with emission factors? Is it a problem with seasonal sampling over my remote sensing technique? Is it measurement noise? Or is it really a discrepancy? Our bottom up inventories just aren't very good for that facility. This is what having the top down measurements really helps us do, especially for these localized top down measurements because you get at the facility scales. Now I wanna talk about something that doesn't have to do as much with inventories, but another use case of the localized point sources, and that's to identify hazards or to identify places where there should be some mitigation. So what I'm showing here on the left is a plot of a methane plume that was detected during an airborne overflight in California with the Avarice NG imaging spectrometer. So they weren't intending to target this neighborhood. They were actually en route to some agricultural sectors to, to try to map out methane from dairy operations. But they had the instrument turned on and they noticed, and they processed data in real time on the, on the instrument, they noticed these big plumes emanating from a residential neighborhood. So they saw them, they were very confident it was a real signal and not something spurious, and they notified the gas company. The gas company went there and within 24 hours, they did confirm that it was a uh, distribution pipeline leak. They opened up the road um, where that leak was happening and remediated it. And then the airborne team flew, you know, almost immediately after it was reported to be re remediated and they fixed the leak. So again, this is an important, I'll get to the, you know, this handoff challenge, but this is something that's, you know, it's important for inventories and it's important for budgets because this is methane rele released to the atmosphere. But in this case, it was actually more of a public health hazard. Um, and by knowing who the right people were to give this data and inform them, some really important remediation happened very quickly. And you know, people in this community no longer had to uh, be breathing this hazardous uh, you know, pipeline gas. Um, you know, on a bigger scale, there are large anomalous events that are also detected by these localized sources. I showed the example of the ultra emitters from Trobomi. Other satellites do this, um, or airborne uh, imaging spectrometers at various spatial resolutions. The panel on the left is in acquisition with that same Avarice NG airborne imaging spectrometer of a huge gas blowout that happened in the Los Angeles uh, area, an area called the Liso Canyon. It's a big gas storage facility that blew out and emitted a lot of methane, you know, 20 to 50 tons per hour of methane over the course of several months before they were able to remediate it. Um, the airborne team was able to go fly multiple times to do the quantification, but also see, you know, the the uh, communities that were being impacted. And all these communities were evacuated, but you can see that the plume was, uh, you know, extending into the residential neighborhoods. Um, similarly, the PRISMA satellite, which is a, we talked about before, but a coarser spectral resolution imaging spectrometer, so it doesn't quite have the same precision as something like Avarice NG, but still for very large emission rates, 
is able to make a reliable quantification. And this is a big gas blowout that occurred in 2020 in Assam, India. And this one, again, lasted um, on and off for about five months and impacted that community. Now, this is a this is actually another important use case of the fine resolution satellite imaging spectrometers is that this was a scene that Tropomi never saw because during May, June, in this part of India is the monsoon. And so it's pretty cloudy most of the time. Um, but with this satellite prism imaging spectrometer, because we're at 30 meter spatial resolution, there were clouds in this scene, but in one of the acquisitions it got, there was just enough not obscured by clouds that a quantification of methane emissions was possible and the big plume was detected and quantified. So having this type of information really helps us know these last three examples of where are you know potentially hazardous hotspots that may be impacting local communities and what should be remediated this can also be applied for things that aren't just immediate hazards to a community but also to improve efficiency of a uh, you know gas production and uh, processing pipeline or supply chain you know for example a company may not know they have a large problem at some part of their upstream facilities, if you have satellite information that can delineate these big plumes and you can get it into the right hand, it's kind of in everybody's benefit for that to get mitigated from the company standpoint. It's a, uh, you know, that means that they are improving their operations and from a pub public health and an environmental standpoint, we're releasing less methane into the atmosphere for climate implications. And if it's, you know, around a populated area, we're also improving, you know, potential public health consequences. Um, and then, you know, the last point I want to say again, kind of on this mitigation is it's not just, it's not just pointing a one-off to an operator or an agency or the gas company and saying, here it is, do what you're going to do with it. But this can also be used to validate improvements um, to infrastructure. And so what I'm showing here is an example in Los Angeles where on the panel on the left, the aircraft flew in 2016 and noticed really big plumes coming off of the face of the landfill. And uh, the crew notified the local enforcement agency of that landfill and the landfill operators themselves. And the landfill operators took it, digested it, and then planned a set of really profound remediation efforts over the following year, which included adding, you know, putting more wells onto the face of the landfill to capture more gas, but also putting various types of impermeable covers on top of the landfill to just try to keep, to basically to cap the emissions from the landfill. The airborne crew then continued to fly over that year while that remediation was taking place to verify and validate, okay, are, is it having the intent, intended effect? They shared the data with the company. And that's what I have shown here on the time series on the bottom is the blue lines represent odor complaints that are coming from the surrounding community. And the red dots represent methane that was quantified by the aircraft. And you can see there's a very good correlation that as the remediation efforts went into place around April of 2017, uh, the methane emissions dropped off substantially and so did the odor complaints in the community. So this is again, something that can be used for validation as you're trying to implement new practices or fix things. It's important to image beforehand, identify the problems, image while the remediation is happening to see are we getting some improvements and then certainly after to make sure that it was mitigated and that it stays mitigated. It's not as if, you mitigate it once and you never have a problem again. So you have to kind of keep on it to make sure that the emissions are going down. So I just wanted to highlight a few. When we talk about this handoff challenge, these are just some suggestions. This is not comprehensive, but it's really important to understand, you know, how do we get the data into the right hands for mitigation and how do you make mitigation happen? And so again, I'm just suggesting a few examples and things to do um, from success stories that we've had in the past with engaging operators. You know, a lot of the success really comes from how much work you do beforehand. If you kind of, if you, if you try to give satellite remote sensing data sets to someone who doesn't even know that satellites can do this, it's very hard for them to be able to ingest that in an efficient way and really understand it. So what we've found is that if you have a pre-identified partners, uh, if you have pre-identified partners on multiple fronts and you do a lot of work with them beforehand, that really makes a big difference. And this has a few uh, uh, different components to it. One is that you should have a pre-identified partner who's a subject matter expert. Somebody in your region 
who knows a lot about a particular sector. Maybe they're employed by a company, maybe they're not, maybe they're at an agency. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it does matter, but you know, you really just want to find someone who understands, you know, what is the oil and gas operations? What do landfill operations? What does agriculture operations look like in my jurisdiction that I'm interested in? And that way, when you start sharing data, they can really give you those process level insights of what's happening. And it, it really informs the person who is aggregating the data to look for signals and what those signals might be tied to. It's also very important to have a pre-identified partner who has authority in these areas. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a regulator or an agency. It could be the industry themselves. If you know the operator of a landfill, if you know who owns um, oil and gas, and they are receptive to having this data to improve uh, their operations, it's important to identify those people and to work with them as partners so that if those data come in, you have someone who's very receptive or who can enforce. Um, and a big part, what underlies those two big first points is education. You really have to spend the time first understanding the data yourself, which is what this whole seminar is about, is really getting a familiarity with the remote sensing data sets to understand what are they actually telling you within what uncertainties, and then finding out the ways to relate that to your partners. This is critical, so that when you eventually do give data, it's not a total surprise, they're familiar with it. Um, okay, so you've done all that legwork, then you get the data. What we find then is you gotta spend a little bit of time just on your own looking at it, chewing it over and doing a first pass quality control. Okay, I really think it's this. Maybe you even, like let's say it's a localized point source, maybe you wait till you get a few overpasses of your satellite or your airborne just to be confident that what you're seeing is a true signal and then you engage. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly if you see a, a public health hazard, there is some sort of latency where you wanna get that, where you wanna get something quick, but you also need to really do spend that time making sure that the signal you're seeing is a real signal. Um, and you know that's kind of the last point here is because if we do all of this work and we're not educated about it and we send our stakeholders off to something that's kind of a half chewed on idea or it's a false positive or we're not totally sure, that does tend to lose credibility. So again, a lot of this is in the education. So again, this is why this I'm, I'm so excited to be presenting as part of this, as part of this seminar because th this is definitely the first step to that. Okay, this is great. But before I hand it back off to Dave, I want to just take an opportunity to show a use case example where someone can use these multiple satellite remote sensing data sets or flux data sets and really contextualize the methane emissions in a jurisdiction. And so this is only for the state of California but there is a portal called Methane Source Finder where the state of California, in conjunction with NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, took all of the available observations within um, the state of California, whether it was aircraft or flux inversions or prior inventories or GIS infrastructure maps, and put them all together into a common portal. And so this website here, msf.carb.arb.california.gov, um, is that portal. And so I just wanted to walk through a few examples of how maybe if you're developing a similar portal or if you're using something like this or as it maybe it expands um, to other regions, how you could use something um, to this effect. So this portal has multiple layers. For example, if I was a person who wanted to use this inventory to understand what the me my methane emissions were like in the uh, city of Los Angeles in the state of California, I have multiple options where this data has all been presented jointly. So for example, I can start with a gridded emissions map. And so this shows here the EPA gridded inventory. So this is a bottom up inventory like we've talked about, activity and emission factors. And the yellow in this color scale represents higher emissions. So this would just give me, just to begin with, what is a bottom up assessment of the methane emissions that I have within my state? I also have other bottom up um, information which is a GIS inventory that was independently derived from uh, another group that went through all of the records of where are all the oil and gas wells, where are all the landfills, where are all the dairies in the state. And I can use that to say, okay, is my bottom up inventory, you know, getting a good assessment of where, uh, you know, my, my bottom up emission inventory getting a good assessment of my infrastructure. And you can do that in comparison. Again, this is all bottom up. 
Now let's go to the, the fluxes. We talked a lot about using something like Trobolmi or GoSat or OCO to constrain fluxes on a scale in the basin. So this, we also have that here. So here's a Los Angeles flux inversion, which took, sorry, it's on a different gridded scale, uh, different color map. But the idea is now, okay, I maybe used my bottom up inventory as a prior constraint, but then I let the observations that I had, in this case, these were tower observations, but it could be something like Tropomi that I had within my basin to really tell me where the hotspots are. And that's what you start seeing in red. And you can say, okay, well, look at this. I am now seeing what looks like on the scale of maybe five to 20 kilometers um, on one side where certain hotspots are within the basin, these red dots. And you say, oh yeah, look at that. Well, now let me look at my GIS inventory. It looks like that one red area corresponds to agriculture. There's a lot of dairies in this part of Los Angeles. Um, let's look down here at this other red spot. This is where there's a lot of refineries and oil and gas operations, both um, along the coast of Los Angeles. And then in the northern part, you would say, okay, well, look at that. I know there's a big landfill right there. So, okay, this is telling us within several kilometers where we may have an emission source, but it's not at the facility scale, but we've kind of zeroed in now. I'm not looking at the whole city. I'm gonna look at a few different hotspots. Well, let's say now, let's go into our landfill, for example, and let's say now we had aircraft measurements over this landfill. Well, we did. And so let me just uh, put it here. These are the aircraft measurements that I had over this particular landfill, and I'll toggle these other uh, layers off. <coughs> the blue represents the, the outline of the landfill. But now you're saying, okay, that's right. Though that red area that I saw is very likely due to this, you know, this landfill where I'm seeing the plumes, and maybe not this oil and gas operation just to the south where I didn't see any plumes um, when I flew with the aircraft. So you can kind of see how we've now taken multiple of these layers um, apart and used them in conjunction to really get at what are the major sectors within an area. We've said, okay, let's start from a bottom-up view. What do the inventories tell me? But then we overlay on top of that. We say, okay, well, what do the inverse fluxes tell me? Now I have a few different hotspots in my basin I should look at, but I still don't have sector attribution because I don't know if it's the landfill. I don't know if it's the oil and gas. This whole region is red. And then you can say, well, hey, if I have my aircraft or I have my satellite localized plume sources, I can really see, you know what? I think that's coming from the landfill. And so this is just one example, and this is just for the state of California. But this really gets at what we've, what we've talked about you know, in this presentation about using things like tiered observing systems to really be able to leverage multiple data sources and both improve your inventories, but also to prompt mitigation or areas that, you know, if it's a certain jurisdiction or municipality, should get um, some increased attention, at least in terms of the methane emissions. Okay, with that, I want to uh, go back to the presentation and hand it off to uh, Dave, who will be talking about um, emerging opportunities and gaps. So now that we've had an opportunity to see how the top down national budgets and, and local source budgets can be used uh, to inform inventories, we'd like to talk about some emerging opportunities that this provides and also identify a couple of gaps, or at least one serious gap, uh, where we could uh, actually, we, we need to put some more effort. So the first opportunity I'll cover is the possibility of using top-down budgets of carbon dioxide and, and methane to refine emission factors. And this is a big deal, especially in areas such as agriculture, forestry, and other land use, um, where uh, we are trying to derive emissions from bottom-up inventories where we have uh, maybe very uncertain levels of activity or, or, or very, very uncertain emission factors. The biggest issue here is very often the emission factors. For example, a hectare of land in Australia might have a dramatically different emission factor than a hectare of land uh, in Southeast Asia. So uh, in, in this sector, such as uh, in the athlete sector, there's actually uh, quite a lot of uncertainty in these emission factors. Is there a way that we can actually uh, use this uh, use top-down methods to, to inform this. Well, let's see how we do this in a typical uh, 
bottom-up uh, stock change approach for estimating uh, emissions for deforestation, for example. For that, we have a, a somewhat complicated uh, series of, of events we're trying to catch where we've got a, a large number of processes that are going on uh, in a forest. We have the above ground biomass and that might change over time, the number of standing trees. We also have below ground biomass, the, the roots and stems, the roots that have actually um, are buried and, and also the litter and other things that have been buried over time and its interaction and emissions. Uh, we, we have, an, this is just a very, very complicated system. So the questions that you have to ask is kind of uh, in your bottom up inventory is which carbon pools are going to be included in my inventory? How do we assess the carbon change in each carbon pool? For example, the above ground biomass. Do I just count the trees or go, do I actually go and measure them? Um, also below ground biomass. Uh, how do I actually calculate that and how it's changed over time? The total soil carbon. How do I determine changes in how that uh, in, in, the, in the soil carbon stocks so that I can estimate the emissions uh, from those changes in stock? Are there any available field measurements? And in many cases, you might have field measurements, but they might be 10 years old or older. This is hard. And this is one of the, the main areas that where we're, um, we have very large uncertainties in uh, the inventories. So could we actually use the um, atmospheric measurements to do this, to, to improve uh, our understanding of, a, of at least the emission factors? So recall that the change in flux, the amount of carbon dioxide that's being added to the atmosphere in this case, is basically proportional to the product of an activity, say the hectares converted from forest to field or field to forest, uh, and the emission factors, which is the tons of, of, of CO2 that are either released or absorbed uh, in each, uh, for each hectare that's converted. We can rearrange this simple equation and put the emission factor on the left-hand side and show that we can, we can actually estimate the emission factor uh, as uh, the ratio of the measured flux in the atmosphere and the activity. And it turns out the activity is somewhat easier uh, to measure, especially the activity in a process like above ground biomass. So the atmospheric measurements provide a direct constraint on the change in the carbon dioxide flux. These, we can combine these with measurements or maps of activity to provide a spatially and temporally resolved constraint on emission factors. So we're basically just saying, can we get the emission factor if we know the flux in the activity? The other thing we can do with atmospheric top-down budgets is to maybe close the budget when some quantities such as soil carbon simply can't be measured as a stock. And so we can't determine how much the stock of soil carbon has, has changed, for example. This is not unprecedented. Prior to about 2015, uh, the best scientific inventories of, of the carbon cycle actually estimated the entire land sink as a residual of fossil fuel emissions, the ocean sink, and the atmospheric sink. We couldn't measure the land sink directly with any kind of accuracy prior to then. And so it was actually est estimated by looking at the emissions from fossil fuels, that 40 billion tons of, of carbon dioxide each year, looking at the atmospheric growth rate, two to three parts per million per year. And then the ocean sink was easier to, to quantify because basically we can do that by just measuring the changes in the ocean acidity. And these measurements were available on at least decadal time scales with quite good accuracy. So the land sink was actually defined as a residual of the uh, anthropogenic emissions, the atmospheric growth rate in the ocean sink. So the question is, can we expand this idea and use this residual approach to estimate things such as soil carbon? If we have adequate constraints on above ground biomass and reliable atmospheric inversions, we can actually define the soil carbon change as the atmospheric change minus the above ground biomass change. So once again, we're going back to our, our process map here. The above ground biomass is, is something that's relatively straightforward to track. We can actually track the atmospheric carbon change and then assume that the residual is associated with the soil carbon change. 
So this is something that some groups in, around the world are beginning to at attack, uh, and it's actually just an emerging area where we might be able to make another contribution here. Finally, in, in, in this area, I'd like to identify a critical measuring and monitoring gap, and that's the oceans. The oceans cover about 70% of the surface area of the Earth, and the oceans now absorb about 25% of all anthropogenic carbon. Since the beginning of the industrial age, they've actually are respond, the oceans are responsible for over 45, absorbing over 45% of the total anthropogenic emissions. So we have to ask the question, Will this ocean sink continue to remove about this much carbon from the atmosphere uh, over time, uh, or will climate change uh, actually slow that process down, or other processes such as human activities? What is the role of biology in the ocean carbon cycle, and how will that change in response to increasing ocean acidification and climate change? How will the exchanges of carbon between the land, ocean, and atmosphere evolve over time? And finally, how are humans altering the ocean carbon cycle and what are the feedbacks? The answer to these questions and others are absolutely critical in meeting and managing the goals uh, of the Paris Agreement. And this is still an outstanding gap. What are the problems here? Why is this still a gap? Well, once again, uh, the land sink has been uh, a, a quite variable part uh, of the carbon cycle since the beginning of the industrial age. And it's the, the terrestrial uptake of carbon has been roughly balanced by land use change. The ocean is the only cumulative sink we've had uh, since the beginning of the industrial age. Between about 1750 and 2010, as I noted earlier, the oceans have absorbed about 45% of the industrial area. Uh, era of fossil fuel emissions, or about 30% of the total anthropogenic emissions, including land use change. The oceans are currently absorbing about 26% of all anthropogenic fossil fuel emissions. Interestingly, these emissions and removals of carbon dioxide by the ocean are not included in the national inventory reports uh, that are being prepared from the UNFCCC and the global stock takes. The other thing is that these inventories actually are very difficult to compile. Uh, it turns out we have to actually make measurements uh, of carbon dioxide near and near the surface of the ocean, both below and above the surface of the ocean, using in situ sensors, because the space-based observations that we currently have do not yet have the adequate precision or accuracy to really resolve what is from the ocean, as was, was explained in part two uh, of this webinar series. The ocean sink and our ability to monitor it is a serious gap that's not addressed by either bottom-up or top-down methods at this point. How do we ensure the transparency and assess collective progress toward the goals of the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement? Here we're going to look at how we first of all, assure transparency. And once again, here we, we're going to rely on uh, suggestions provided by the IPCC. The first thing that we clearly have to do to ensure the transparency of the top-down methods that we're going to try to use to inform this global stock take is to clearly document the concentration data, the acquisition methods, the analysis methods, and the validation methods for these. That includes clearly describing the measurement approach, the retrieval model capabilities, the priors and other assumptions used uh, as input data, and the traceability of validation of the validation approach to accepted internationally accepted uh, accuracy standards. So in addition to documenting the measurement approach, we also have to document the inverse modeling tools and products. And there, we have to document the model architecture, its spatial and temporal resolution. We have to document the source of meteorological fields. Uh, as you know, the understanding the wind fields uh, are critical to the analysis of these measurements. We have to understand where the prior comes from uh, for concentrations and fluxes. We have to understand 
which greenhouse gas data set that in situ remote sensing land or ocean uh, is, is uh, have been incorporated in the experiments. And as you heard in part two, uh, we're now using a variety of different data sets for that. Finally, we have to document the uncertainties and be best practice for un uncertainty propagation throughout the measurements and the modeling methods. So we have to document the measurement uncertainties and also the inverse modeling uncertainties. All of these are critical to ensure the transparency of these methods. One of the principal potential assets of the top-down greenhouse gas budgets is their potential role in assessing the collective progress toward the goals of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. This, we, this asset is realized because the atmospheric measurements of CO2, CH4, and other greenhouse gases provide a direct constraint on their atmospheric abundances and their trends over time. These data can also provide the input needed to, to the climate modeling community to assess the impacts of greenhouse gas changes on the surface and atmospheric temperatures. They need to know how much carbon dioxide and methane has improved in order to or have, have, have increased in the atmosphere uh, or maybe decreased in the atmosphere uh, to make reliable estimates of how that's going to affect the climate. Regionally, uh, the comparisons of, of top-down and bottom-up inventories um, can show the fraction of the total net emissions and removals captured in the inventories by the individual countries. It can also determine the fraction of fluxes originating from the, un the ocean, unmanaged land, and also those associated with transient events, which are usually excluded from the inventory reports. The atmospheric CO2 and CH4 flux maps can also be combined with high resolution activity maps, as we noted earlier, to yield improved estimates of the emissions factors uh, from the land biosphere. And this could actually help to improve the bottom up inventories in future stock takes. So in summary, some key takeaways from all three parts of this series. We learned in part one that rapid, deep, and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions are absolutely essential to limit the global warming to two degrees C above pre-industrial levels. The global stock takes provide a means of tracking progress toward those goals. Bottom-up national inventories and top-down atmospheric budgets provide complementary information about greenhouse gas emissions and removals. It should be possible to combine the top-down greenhouse gas budgets with bottom-up national inventories to produce a more complete, transparent, and transparent global stock take. However, this is clearly a work in progress, as you've learned. Here, we've re reviewed the advantages and the challenges and the progress to date in efforts to compare and combine bottom-up inventories with top-down budgets. We've also introduced some new opportunities for using top-down atmosphere, CO2 and methane budgets to facilitate the development and the assessments of future, future natural, national inventories. We hope that this has given you a, a good background into the use of these top-down atmospheric CO2 and methane budgets uh, in the verification uh, and validation of the inventories that are being prepared to address the mitigation objectives of the Paris Agreement. With that, I'd like to stop and thank all of you for joining us. We hope you've learned a lot from this webinar series, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, David. Below is the contact information for Dr. David Crisp, Dr. Byrne, and Dr. Cussworth, should you want to follow up with them about anything you learned during today's webinar. You can find all the information about the training, including links to download the materials on the training website shown below. And please check out the many other trainings we have available on the RSET website. We encourage you to also follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings and, <coughs> and events. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's webinar.
Please enter your questions in the question and answer box, and we will answer them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is just uh, Brendan Byrne jumping in again. Uh, so I wanted to point out one thing was that um, yesterday we noticed some issues with the uh, CO2 budget CSV file that we had posted. Um, so if you download those data before uh, today, please um, download the newer file from the same places. And your file should be named uh, CO2 underscore budget underscore burn it all 2022 underscore V1 dot CSV. Um, while I'm on this, I've heard from a couple people that they had um, trouble opening it uh, like mine did. It didn't seem to parse the different uh, comma separated values um, the way mine did. I don't know why that is happening, and I'm currently looking into it and trying to. Uh, regenerate the file so that it's consistent with all different programs to look at CSV files. Um, and then finally, I'll just point out that the uh, we, we've currently only posted the country uh, file for the CO2 budget. Um, the one by one degree file will be posted over the coming weeks, um, but it's still being finalized. And you'll be able to access that in the same places uh, that you're able to access the um, the country file. All right, thanks. So with that, I'll hand it back uh, for questions. Yeah, Brandon, thanks so much for those updates. Uh, that's great to hear. Um, so jumping into the question and answer session, question one, could you clarify whether the top-down method involves direct measurement of emissions in the atmosphere, or is it using modeling? So this is Dave Crisp. If you can hear me, I'll start on this question, and, and I'm sure Brendan will want to chime in as well. Uh, it, as, it, as, uh, as we note here, there's really no direct way to measure uh, a flux uh, from anything larger than, say, a smokestack or something like that. Uh, so when we always are going to use uh, top, uh, we're always going to use some combination of measurements and models. And, and so top-down measurements, for example, uh, as we described in part two, and then again today, uh, use a combination of uh, measurements, both direct and indirect. Uh, and also models to estimate the, the methane and CO2 fluxes uh, that we've been reporting here. Uh, the concentrations of, of atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, and methane can be measured directly by in situ sensors. Uh, we then have to, we would have to combine those, in, those measurements, of course, with some measurement of the, of the, uh, the, the flow of the wind uh, to estimate a flux, for example. And, and, this, and if you're trying to, apply, trying to uh, estimate the flux from the surface, you actually need to measure the vertical wind uh, from the surface. We do that with small stations called flux towers, but that's the, the largest scale that we can measure uh, things directly. Um, we also can collect data at uh, high spatial resolution over the entire globe uh, using uh, satellites, as, as you've learned, uh, and also ground-based remote sensing systems. Uh, these measurements uh, actually, these, these measurements are actually the measurements of reflected sunlight. We have to analyze those measurements with one model uh, in order to uh, retrieve estimates of carbon dioxide and methane from these observations of reflected sunlight. And then we have to validate those results against every possible standard. And then we can assimilate them into uh, atmospheric inverse models like the ones that Brendan Byrne uh, described in, in part two. Um, and uh, that, that, uh, or plume models like those uh, uh, that Dan Cusworth described in part two of the series. Um, those models then yield estimates of the fluxes uh, that on, on a range of scales uh, spanning individual smokestacks uh, up to the globe. Uh, so, um, we, 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 so while we can't make measurements, direct measurements uh, of fluxes, uh, we can make direct measurements of winds and direct measurements of, uh, of CO2 and uh, methane concentrations and use those to estimate a flux uh, or uh, uh, on larger, much larger scales, uh, scales of say nations, uh, we can use uh, atmospheric inverse models to estimate fluxes from the observed concentrations. I, I hope that answers that question, but once again, I can pass it over. Brendan, you have, uh, Brendan and Dan, you have something to add? 
I think you covered it well. I just um, kind of want to make, I know sometimes the word model can uh, make people nervous, but I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, um, in general, estimating fluxes involves modeling in some way. And so typically when you do bottom up stuff, you make measurements at very small scales. And you, if you want to get to say a country level um, fluxes, you, you have to, uh, you know, mathematically describe some process to go from say, uh, you know, measuring the amount of carbon stored around several trees in a forest to the amount of carbon stored over a country. And so with atmospheric CO2 data, you have to do this modeling um, from the top down. So really the atmospheric CO2 data gives you kind of a large scale constraint on, on fluxes uh, in general, in, in terms of the, the data set I described. And you, your modeling kind of helps you um, resolve smaller scale uh, fluxes that get you back down to country level sources and sinks. So yeah. yeah. That was all. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Dave and Brennan. Uh, question two. Uh, the lockdown has different limitations with respect to different levels of lockdown. Is the period chosen here during the time when road transport was restricted? Uh, the short answer here is yes. Uh, the particular demonstration we showed here, uh, we were looking at the first four or five months of the pandemic when the lockdowns, uh, the initial lockdowns were most extreme. Uh, so the specific example that we showed uh, in this in this uh, presentation was from that period. Uh, as as Brendan shows, as Brendan notes uh, at the bottom of this this question, uh, there have also been some studies of uh, emissions from uh, lockdown from from during the lockdown periods from uh, large cities such as San Francisco uh, and uh, also Toronto. And those studies have also been pub published. So yes, we've been uh, using this unfortunate, uh, inadvertent uh, experiment in in, uh, in emissions reductions uh, as a way of testing our, our capabilities uh, to this date, and uh, have learned uh, that we can, in fact, measure uh, variations in emissions uh, as small as a few percent uh, over individual nations. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Dave. Question three. What is the sampling frequency of space-based measurements adaptable for integration with a bottom-up inventory? I, I only sort of answered this question in, in the text shown here, basically pointing out that at this point, we make measurements that span uh, time periods of one day uh, up to about one month. That's about how long it takes to map up the entire globe using uh, especially the space-based uh, measurement capabilities. Um, I didn't note here, but uh, the, the uh, ground-based measurement capabilities have roughly weekly uh, time uh, frequ uh, frequency uh, repeat cycles. Um, but in any case, uh, what we can do is assimilate the data that we're collecting from the existing space-based uh, and ground-based networks into the atmospheric inverse models that you've heard uh, about from, from Brendan uh, and then the plume models we've heard about from Dan. And, and we can uh, report on a whole variety of different uh, time periods that span anything from maybe as short as, as a month uh, to something as long as a, a year or multiple years. Uh, so what we're now doing is working with the, we're just beginning to work with the bottom-up inventory community to determine exactly uh, how best to meet the requirements. So we're asking them specifically, uh, about how 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 would they would like to see these top-down inventories uh, developed and delivered uh, in order to uh, best support uh, their needs, and we're getting a, a wide range of answers from that. I think in most cases uh, we're being asked for annual inventories, but in several cases, in order to better diagnose or understand the differences seen between the top-down and bottom-up inventories. Uh, the bottom-up inventory compilers are asking us at least for seasonal results and sometimes uh, at much finer uh, resolution. So we're looking into that now and we look forward to continuing to work with the bottom-up inventory community to find out exactly what they need. Thanks, Dave. Question number four, are the current spatial resolutions and coverage adapted to quantify greenhouse gases only for medium slash large countries or is it suitable also for small countries, such as low latitude in the low latitude range? Uh, 
Uh, I can jump in here for um, uh, more specifically for the CO2 budget data set that we've provided. So I would say uh, first in general, um, you know, the, the measurement systems uh, like the, the satellite data are, are still pretty sparse, as they've mentioned. A lot of the satellites that are currently flying are, are more kind of, um, you know, proof of concept type missions. And we really need very dense data to get at some of these smaller countries. So, so it's very challenging at the moment. Um, for the CO2 uh, budget data set that we provide, uh, you know, we really encourage people to look at that uh, IAD, influence of assimilated data to help inform how much a certain country is being, the, the CO2 fluxes for a country are being informed by um, the assimilated data. Um, and that can help uh, help you uh, understand, you know, how, how much of an impact the data is having. Similarly, um, we didn't cover too much, but for uh, a methane uh, budget that CIOS has developed, there's a, there's a similar metric that's used to help um, uh, quantify how much the atmospheric measurements are informing the, the sources and sinks for different countries. Um, so yeah, use those data. The other thing that I would say is that for our CO2 budget, for a lot of these smaller countries where we have a really hard time with the current data coverage, uh, we have aggregate regions, so exam for example, the European Union, African Union, Association of South Asian Nations, which can give you kind of a regional um, sources and sinks involving smaller countries, um, but are, are somewhat better constrained by our available measurements. Um, I don't know if anyone else would like to jump in on this one. I'll just point out that, that the uh, budgets that we presented here are called pilot budgets and they're primarily intended to provide uh, examples of what we can do today based on cap the capabilities that are currently deployed, both in the measurements and modeling community. Um, but it's also very important to understand uh, that groups around the world are uh, in the process of, of substantially improving our capabilities in both ground-based and space-based measurements. Uh, and so we'll be, ma be making measurements, as Brendan mentioned, at much higher spatial and, and temporal frequency uh, as time goes on. Uh, the modeling community is going to respond to these measurements by building models that can uh, fully exploit the capabilities and information in those um, in those measurements. And so what we're expecting to see is between now, uh, between the first stock take in 2023 and the second stock take in 2028, we expect to see uh, the capabilities improve substantially in both the, metal, the measurement and modeling domain. And we expect that those improvements uh, will allow us uh, to cover a much broader range of countries uh, in say 2028 and beyond uh, than we can cover today. So once again, I hope that answers that question. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. And looking at the time, we are almost at the top of the hour. And I do want to respect everybody's time, especially the participants, because we know that you're all have much to do and you're all leading a very busy life. So as we wrap up, you know, again, this is the last part of this three part webinar series. I, I do want to thank all the participants for joining, especially those that, that stayed for all three parts. We hope that you got a lot out of this training. Uh, we do look forward to uh, receiving your feedback. You'll be receiving a, a survey in the next uh, week or two. And we do hope that you will reply to that survey so that you can give us feedback on, on, on what you thought about this training and what other future training topics that you feel are most valuable to you in your line of work. So before we wrap up, I do want to hand it back to uh, Dr. Crisp, Cusworth, and, and Dr. Byrne uh, for any closing comments that you all might have. This is Brendan just again. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just, just going to say thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Um, don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. And I'd like to thank the, the RSET team uh, for, for pulling all this together. And once again, from Dave Chris, I, I want to once again thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I hope uh, that the information that we provided in this three-part series has provided at least an introduction to the use of top-down uh, atmospheric measurements and models uh, to constrain uh, fluxes and, and uh, inventories of, of carbon dioxide and methane uh, on a range of scales uh, between, uh, say, individual smokestacks or large urban areas uh, to the globe. Uh, this is, uh, we, we recognize that these, these topics were uh, 
maybe a, a little bit obscure uh, as you came in. And we, we once again thank our brave audience for jumping in and, and perhaps uh, becoming uh, early adopters uh, of these techniques uh, for quantifying uh, the emissions and removals of carbon dioxide and methane uh, to support the global stock takes. So with that, thank you very much. And once again, I, I look forward to uh, uh, questions, surveys, and, and I, I look forward to seeing your responses to the homework questions. Thanks much. And uh, Dr. Cusworth, I don't know, did you have any closing thoughts or comments? No, just agree with all of the above. Thanks so much. And uh, this is a real exciting time and we're certainly open to answer additional questions after this webinar. Thanks so much. Wonderful. And I also want to acknowledge the RSET team. Uh, that is uh, Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, uh, Sarah Cutshaw, and Melanie Fulop-Cook for uh, providing support for this webinar series. So again, thank you to all the participants for joining. Please do fill out the survey and complete the homework by the due date. And we look forward to seeing you all at the next RSET training. So be well. Thank you.